Uh, we had reached this part and we were supposed to give the reagents uh, and name the mechanism of reaction number one, which we already did. Kate was a uh, free radical substitution. We did the initiation, propagation step, etc. So, so this part is already done. And then uh, you're being asked to draw the structure of the product form. Obtain if reaction one is carried out using an excess of chlorine. So uh, what would happen if you use an excess of chlorine, which means if you use too much chlorine, then what would happen is uh, that in free radical substitution, all the hydrogen atoms are going to get eventually substituted. So it's going to be, uh, I mean, this part over here would become the H would all be gone and this would become CCL3. Okay. Ali, is this clear? Sarah, is this clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, the next question is, uh, uh, you're being asked to write, uh, you're being asked to write the equation, including state symbols to represent the lattice energy of calcium chloride. So what's, what, what is lattice energy by definition? It's the, it's the energy released when one mole of uh, ionic solid, which in this case is going to be calcium chloride, and it's going to be one mole of ionic solid is formed from its gaseous ions, which in this case would be calcium ions. in gaseous state and two Cl minus one ions. And they would also be in gaseous state. So ions getting together to form an ionic lattice, that's uh, lattice energy. And you have to uh, complete the uh, a fully labeled bond able cycle that can be used to calculate the lattice energy of, del of uh, calcium chloride. So you start off with enthalpy of formation. Okay, that's already given. Uh, and you have to somehow reach the other end. Uh, the three, two, three steps that you need to do. First thing is you atomize the, the atoms. Uh, so what you're going to do is that calcium solid would become calcium. It would become calcium gas. So that is the enthalpy change of atomization of calcium. Uh, Cl2 remains as it is. So that's delta H atomization of, of CA. And then the next step is uh, th that you break the chlorine-chlorine bonds. And if you do that, chlorine atoms are formed. So that would be calcium gaseous atoms are already formed. Now you're going to break the chlorine-chlorine bond to form two Cl gaseous atoms. And that would be equal to the bond energy of, of the CLCL bond. Uh, because that's what you're going to break. Uh, Cl2 molecule breaks into Cl atoms. Then you ionize them. If you ionize them, uh, and these are all endothermic processes, which is why the arrow is going up. If you ionize them, calcium is supposed to lose two electrons. It would form calcium two plus, And two electrons would be lost and you have two Cl gaseous atoms as it is. So that's the first plus second ionization energy of Ca. Uh, then you're going to, uh, the two electrons that are lost, they would now be gained by Cl. So the next step is is exothermic. So calcium is already in the form of an ion. And now the CLs have all also gained electrons to form to form a negative ion. And finally, the last step is uh, that the gaseous ions are going to get together to form the ionic lattice. We call this electron affinity. Ah, okay, that one is electron affinity. And that one is two times electron affinity of uh, Cl because you have two Cl atoms. And the last step is the lattice energy where the gaseous ions are getting together to form the solid ionic lattice. Okay? So that's that's the complete bond ever cycle. Okay? You atomize, you make them into ions and then the ions get together to form the ionic solid. And that's your lattice energy. And you're now being asked to calculate the lattice energy. What's given is uh, uh, you're going to apply the Hess law. What is given is enthalpy of formation of CaCl2 is given. That's minus 796. So I think that's this value. 
So minus seven ninety six. That's that's provided. Next is. So next one is enthalpy change of atomization of calcium. So that's also given. That's given as uh, uh, plus one seventy eight. So. So plus one seventy eight. That's this one. And then you have electron affinity of chlorine atoms. That's minus three forty nine. So that's the part over here. It's uh, minus three forty nine into two. You have to be very careful careful with the moles over here. So you have to count the moles very carefully. That you have, if you have two Cl atoms, then the electron affinity would be multiplied by two. That's the only thing that's given. So what is missing? Uh, what's missing is the is the bond energy of CLCL, and you're going to find that in the data booklet. So let's open the data booklet. That's uh, so bond energy of CLCL. It's two hundred forty-two. Take it, Kevin. It's two hundred forty-two. So take that's plus two forty-two because you're breaking the bond, right? So it's endothermic, and you also need the first and second anodization energy of calcium. So that's multiplied uh, by two. Nee, why not multiplied by two? Because uh, because you're just breaking one bond. I mean, you're getting two Cl atoms, but the bond. The number of bonds okay, that you're yes. breaking is one, right? So you have to be very careful with yeah. with with the quantities that you're using. I said, anyways, uh, what's next is the is the first and second ionization energy of calcium. That's that's needed. So that must be somewhere on this on this page. Calcium is five ninety and eleven fifty. That's five hundred ninety. Yes. So calcium is five hundred ninety plus eleven fifty, I think. So, so we have all the values now. The only value that's missing is the lattice energy. So, so one path is equal to the other path. So, so I want to go from this point, and I want to reach this point. Now, the other path for lattice energy is going to be you go all the way around. Right, you go in this direction. Uh, so, all these values, their sign would change. I mean, lattice energy would be equal to one path is equal to the to the other path. So it's going to be uh, this sign would change. That would be plus three forty three forty nine into two. Okay, you have to go all the way around. Uh, their signs would change as well. That would be minus five ninety. And minus eleven fifty. Now I have uh, reached this point. Uh, now I have to reach the other point. That would be minus two forty two. And then from minus two forty two, uh, I would reach over here. That would be minus one seventy eight. And finally, from minus one seventy eight, I would have to reach over here. That would be minus seven ninety six. So that's that is what lattice energy would be equal to. One path, which is this one, would be equal to the other path, which is go all the way from the other side, uh, change the direction of all these arrows. Uh, the signs are going to change, uh, and you're going to get this expression. Can anyone cal tell me and calculate this? What is the value of this expression? And the last thing is you have to be very careful with your calculator. When you're entering numbers, Zara Ali, did you try this? Yes, sir. Um, negative two thousand two hundred fifty-eight. Negative two thousand two hundred fifty-eight. Um, yes. Okay, so it's uh, and we can have a look at it. Okay, 
Uh, I mean, which paper is this? This is M1642. And then he's he's talking about the next part. Is to, he's talking about the entropy of the system. Just one second. Let's well, we can we can check the answer later. He's talking about the entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system. Describe and explain what happens to the entropy of a gas when the temperature is increased. Uh, still loading. I said, what happens? Uh, what happens to the disorder if the if the gas is being heated? Let's say these are gas particles. But the, the, what happens when gases are heated? Can you explain kinetic particle theory? What happens to a gas? Sir, uh, energy increases. Okay, so the kinetic energy increases and the gas particles, they move further away from each other. And the gas expands. Okay, for example, a gas in a balloon is going to expand, right? Uh, so that means disorder is going to be greater. What would happen is gas molecules would move further apart. Uh, they become uh, energetic. And they would overcome the intermolecular forces. And when they overcome the intermolecular forces, uh, uh, they would move further apart and the entropy would increase. And your entropy increases. So it's a two mark question. Do you still not open? So let's move to the next part. Sir, uh, entropy uh, uh, depends upon the entropy of system and surrounding, right? Nee, listen, well, entropy of surrounding is not in your course. TK. What? Oh, whenever you get a question of entropy, you're, you're basically just talking about the system. That's it. Not the surrounding. TK, that's not in your course. So just a second. Uh, TK, we got that right. I said, so did you talk about having more energy? And entropy increase. I mean, the entropy is disorder. They didn't explain. One mark was for entropy. One was one was for having more energy. Uh, one mark was for the entropy increasing. So they didn't give mark for the explanation. So next one. Now for each reaction, predict the sign of entropy change. So, so for the first one, it's given. Uh, what would be the sign of entropy change for the next one? Is this disorder decreasing or increasing? A gas is turning into a solid. Decreasing? Decreasing, so it's going to be negative, right? Do you can remember whenever the moles of gas decrease, disorder decreases. What about this one? Uh, there's a liquid initially, and now that everything is a solid. Decrease. So that's also negative. And the last one, uh, what about the last one? What's happening here? Increases. TK, and focus on the gas. Like there's a gas forming. So there's obviously more disorder now. Initially, there was no door, uh, no gas. So this is positive. Disorder is increasing. Explain why the entropy change for the first process is negative. Uh, because the number of moles of gas decrease. So number of moles of gas 
they decrease. Uh, so you have fewer gas molecules, two molecules initially, but now you just have one molecule. And then you're being asked uh, for entropy questions. You 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 just have two formulas that you have to use. Uh, this is the first one of first one. Uh, the first one is that you'll be given the entropy of the products and the reactants. So what you're simply going to do is, if you're being asked to find the entropy change, the entropy change would be the change in entropy of a reaction would be the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. If you find the difference, uh, you'd be able to figure out the entropy of a reaction. <coughs> this one second, my board is not responding. So it's kind of answer if, if uh, so product minus reactant. So the product is N is three and two of them. So it's going to be 193 times two and minus minus the reactants. The reactants are N2 is 192. Again, you have to be very careful about the sign. Uh, the other one is uh, 131, but that's going to be times 3. What is the answer that we're getting? Five eighty-seven. Yes. Positive? Yes, sir. Yes. It's positive. I th it should be negative, I think. I mean, it has to be negative. 131 into 3, 192. I, I, th I think it's going to be negative. Let me just quickly check. Yes, sir. Uh, negative 199. I think it's going to be negative 199. One way to check this is, K, uh, I mean, the equation is in front of you. So there are four molecules of gas turning into two molecules of gas. So that means uh, lesser gas is getting formed. So... So, okay, anyways, it's obviously minus one, minus 199. Okay, just make sure on your calculator, use brackets. Make sure you use brackets, put brackets. Where it, I mean, if you, if you, so that the calculator clearly knows what's happening. Now, the next one is we, we figured out the, uh, I said this, now this is a separate reaction. Now, whether or not a chemical reaction is spontaneous can be reduced by calculating the change in delta G at a given temperature. Calculate the value of delta G. Uh, delta G is the overall energy that's available to a system for useful work. Uh, it includes the enthalpy change, the heat energy that's being produced, and the work done due to entropy change. So it's minus T delta S. Uh, and you have to calculate delta G. So delta H is 117 and kilojoules per mole and minus t what temperature are they asking for that should be in kelvins 298 multiplied by delta s which is uh, 0.175 kilojoules per kelvin per mole the kelvin part would get cancelled out If you multiply it by temperature, uh, remember one of the, the units should be the same. It should either be kilojoules or joules. So make sure you use uh, the proper unit for convert one of them to the proper unit. Uh, either convert all of them to joules or convert them into kilojoules. Uh, what is the answer that we're getting? Sixty-four point eight five. Take it at sixty-four point. 85 in kilojoules, right? So we're getting that in kilojoules. 
Now, use your answer to explain whether or not this reaction is spontaneous. It's not spontaneous because you're getting a positive value. Which means that overall, the system requires energy from outside. Okay, so that would be, I mean, it's a one mark question. So probably just no explanation required. Delta G is positive. So the reaction is not spontaneous. 64 point, what did we get? 64.85. Do you get positive? Now, the next part is about, about transition metals and the electronic structure of the falling species have to be written first. Uh, so cobalt, I'm not sure what cobalt is. Uh, nickel, cobalt, copper. I think it's 27. Let me just confirm. So cobalt is 27. Cobalt is 27. So you have to write uh, the electronic configuration of cobalt. Uh, till argon, you have 18 electrons. After argon, you have 3D and 4S. Uh, the 4S is going to go first. It's uh, it's going to be two electrons, so that's uh, 20. Now seven electrons in the in the D subshell. And when cobalt two plus ion is formed, the electrons are lost from the outermost shell. So the 4S electrons are going to go. TK is going to form an ion. Now, in an isolated transition metal atom, the five D orbitals have the same energy. When a transition metal ion forms a tetrahedral complex, the D orbitals are split into two groups of different energies. Complete. So, what's why do why do transition metals form colored compounds, and why they why are they colored? Uh, the reason they form a, form colored compounds is that if you look at a cobalt two plus ion, uh, it's going to attract. I mean, it has a it has a three D subshell. Uh, it has, so it has, uh, one second. So this is this is cobalt's uh, axis around the cobalt atom. Uh, the 3D subshell, there are five types of 3D subshells or uh, orbitals. There's some that li that, li that lie on the axis. The electron density lies right on the axis. And then there are others where the electron density lies between the axis. So there, there are five types of D subshells. There's 3D XY, there's 3D XZ, and then there's 3D YZ. I mean, these lie between the axes. And then you have orbitals that lie on the axis, the red ones that are lying on the axis. That's 3D X square minus Y square and 3D Z square. So you have you have a total of five five D subshells around the cobalt uh, nucleus. Uh, this is how the how the D subshell looks like. Okay, so, f so five of them around the nucleus. Uh, I mean, these two are lying on the axis, one on the Z axis, these are lying exactly on the electron density is lying exactly on the X and Y axis. And then you have uh, orbitals that are lying between the axis, between the Z and Y axis, between the Z and X axis, between the X and Y axis. So DXY, DXZ and DYZ orbitals. So five of them. So I've, I've drawn over here, I've drawn all five of them together. This is what it, it's going to look like. Now, now this is the inner shell. The 3D is the inner shell. It has seven electrons, which means the electrons are going to be, I mean, the D, D subshell is not going to be complete. Uh, there would be, so there, so there would be space available. And then it's going to form, it's going to form a complex. It's going to, it's going to attract because cobalt is two plus, it's going to attract ligands from different sites. For example, it's going to attract water molecules, 
water is a smaller ligand, so usually what happens is that you get uh, six water molecules around the cobalt two plus ion. Take it just one second, the board is still loading. So just hold on a second, it'll be like me, yeah. uh, board is still not working till he gets here. I said, so we were discussing how, how uh, do the D subsets spread, okay? Right now, they're all at the same, well, without the ligands, they're all at the exact same energy level. There's no difference whether it's between the axis or it's on the axis. But when the ligands, they start approaching and they start uh, forming dative bonds with uh, with our central metal line. So you have these ligands coming in from all sides. So ligands coming in from all sides. And then what happens is that it becomes really difficult to keep electrons on the orbitals that are lying on the axis. Okay, so the ones that I'm sharing, it's going to become difficult to keep electrons in those orbitals. So on the axis, it becomes difficult, but between the axis, it kind of becomes easier. The electrons are going to prefer uh, areas, remember th this D subshell is not the one that's involved in bonding. These lone pairs are attracted uh, to the outer orbitals. Uh, so they have nothing to do with the D subshell. But since the lone pairs are approaching in the same direction, uh, it kind of becomes difficult to keep electrons over here. So what happens is that if you look at your D subshell, the ones that are lying on the axis, they would be at a higher energy because it's going to become difficult to keep electrons in the red orbitals that I've drawn over here. Okay, so this is what happens that your D subshell splits. The 3D X square minus Y square is the and the 3D Z square orbitals. They become your higher energy orbital and your and your 3D X Y, 3D X Z. And 3D YZ, they become your lower energy orbitals. These are the these are the shaded red ones. And these are the ones that are that have drawn in green over there, TK in the diagram. And um, it had seven electrons, right? So electrons. They were a total. So there are total six electrons and one electron over here and zero over here. So electrons from the lower energy D subshell would then jump and they would move to the high energy D subshell by absorbing frequencies from the visible spectrum. So there's going to be an energy gap and that energy gap would be proportional to a frequency from the from visible spectrum which is why colored compounds would be uh, transition metals. They, they would form colored compounds because the energy gap exactly matches uh, frequencies from the visible spectrum. This is for an octahedral complex. Now for a tetrahedral complex, uh, there's something slightly different happens that the ligands are not approaching on the axis. In a tetrahedral complex, uh, the angles are 109.5 degrees. So none of them are on the axis. So in that case, the splitting happens, but it happens the other way around. 
that the ones on the axis uh they would be the ones where it would be easy to keep electrons and the ones in the middle of the axis are the ones where it's going to be difficult to keep electrons because the ligands would be approaching at an angle of 109.5 degrees they would not be on the axis they would actually be between the axis so this is for an octahedral complex and for a tetrahedral complex which in this question they're actually saying that it's forming a tetrahedral complex so in a tetrahedral complex the ones on the axis 3dxy and 3dxz and 3dyz the ones in the middle of the axis that's where the where it's going to be harder to keep electrons and it would be easier to keep electrons in the 3d x square minus y square or 3d z square which are lying on the axis and there's going to be an energy gap and the electrons would move from the low energy gap to low energy d subshell to a high energy d subshell by absorbing a frequency from the visible spectrum theek hai so is this clear to everyone why transition metals are colored theek hai sara is this clear ali clear yes sir therefore this is clear so in the question they were asking about the tetra uh, they were asking about the isolated uh, metal line all the d subshells are at the same energy level and for a tetrahedral complex the d subshell would split into two energy levels uh 3d xy xz and yz would be your high energy d subshell and the ones on the axis that would be easier to keep electrons so that's where they would be at your low energy d subshell then write the formula of this complex showing the overall charge so saying they're saying that cobalt 2 forms a six coordinate complex containing three water molecules and three chloride ions so we can we can write the formula it's going to be co they would be three cl's and three water molecules and uh, the overall charge on this thing is going to be water is neutral cl is minus 1 so that's minus 1 times 3 that's minus 3 and cobalt i think was 2 plus so it's uh, the total charge would be minus 1 because this is 2 plus and this over here is minus 1 so if you add up the charges and and water is zero so if you add up all the charges i th i think you should be getting minus 1 and explain with the aid of a diagram how many isomers of the complex in one exist so we need to draw the complex it's it's an octahedral complex they've already told us six bonds so octahedral complex would be cobalt in the middle so this is your x and y axis and that's your that's your z axis take all three axes three water molecules so the water molecules would be all so this is a cis isomer and the cl minus 1 are all together and then there's going to be a trans isomer which is where the water molecules would be opposite to each other and the cl minus 1 are also making an angle of 180 degrees okay is this clear ali clear sara is this clear yes sir yes sir then write the formula of the complex showing the overall charge if appropriate the platinum forms a four coordinate complex containing two ammonia molecules and two chloride ions so it's going to be pt it contains two ammonia and two cl ions cl is minus 1 so the overall 
in two of them. And the overall charge would be zero because they said that we platinum was two plus, and we know that Cl is minus one and ammonia is zero. If you if you add them up, it's going to be zero. The overall charge is going to be zero. And draw the structure. Now the platinum thing is cisplatin and transplatin. See, platinum, you studied this as an anti-cancer drug. Cisplatin was where the CLs were bought together. And it was a square planar molecule. And the two NH3s were, were together. Platinum in the middle was two plus. This was your cisplatin molecule. And then you had a trans version for this where what would happen is that the CLs were opposite to each other. And the NH3 lone pairs were also opposite to each other. And this was your trans, this was your transplatin molecule. And then they're saying state which isomer this is, uh, you saying one of the, one of them is an important anti-cancer drug. State which isomer this is and explain why the isomer is effective. So cisplatin, the one that we have drawn over here, is the one. That's your anti-cancer drug. And the reason was that uh, what is cancer? Cancer is when the DNA becomes damaged. And DNA has three things. It, it's formed from a nucleotide. There's a phosphate group, there's a base, and there's a sugar. And the thing just keeps on repeating. And you had a, you had a base. What cisplatin would do is that it's going to come in. It already, already has an NH3. The base is a nitrogen base, and the lone pairs would get attracted to platinum, and it would it would uh, irreversibly bind with the DNA uh, strand, and the DNA strand would become useless. It would not be able to replicate, and the cancer would not be able to grow because the DNA is not replicating into other molecules. So the damaged DNA uh, replication could be stopped in this way. Uh, we can have a look at what exactly were they looking for. Uh, so they've talked about the cis one and they have talked about that this can react or bind with the DNA, which prevents a replication of the strand. So that's pretty much it. So where's the paper? And then they are asking you to write uh, the expression for. Uh, they're asking you to write an expression for case stability, which is basically the KC for a ligand exchange reactions. Uh, remember, ligands can be replaced by other ligands. Uh, if you add NH3, NH3 is a ligand. It's going to knock out the water molecules and take their place. And since it's an aqueous solution. Always remember in aqua solution, when you write uh, case stability products over reactants, uh, you don't write water because water is in excess and its concentration would, al would almost be a constant because it's an aqua solution. So there's too much water everywhere. So you don't write, if you're writing KC expressions or KP expressions or any expression related to uh, equilibrium constant, then water is not written in the expression because if it's aqueous. So the product is, CUNH3 four and H2O is twice. And this entire thing is two plus. So it's concentration divided by the reactants and the reactants in this case are CUH206. Two plus its concentration and NH3 concentration would be power four. And you can calculate the unit. The unit is going to be mole per dm cube. So it's mole per dm cube divided by mole per dm cube into mole per dm cube power four. And it would eventually come out to be x to the power minus four, the x. So it's mole per dm cube to the power minus four.
which would give you mole minus 4 and uh, dm would become 12. So that's what your unit is. And explain how this value, as so a what does case stability indicate? If you have a high case stability value, that means you're getting more products. That's why the case stability value is higher because you have more products. Uh, so that like an exchange would happen at a very fast pace. If you have a very low case stability value, that means the equilibrium is shifted to the left. You're getting more reactants, which is why you're getting a case stability value, which is very low. So over here, they have a very high case stability value, which is 1.2 times 10 power 13. So explain how it relates to the relative stability of the two complexes. So a high value of case stability would indicate that you're going to get more products. More products are going to be formed. This is going to be more stable and this is going to be unstable. Do you get the reaction is favoring the forward reaction? Is this clear as well? Sarah, is this clear? Ali, is this clear? Yes, sir. Let's uh, continue with this, TK, next class then. TK, okay, take care, love is.